Okay, so a really, really warm welcome to you. Um, thank you so much for coming today. We're really happy that you joined us. Um, so if you've just arrived, um, feel free to say hi in the chat box and let us know um, where in the world you're joining us from. Um, I'm just gonna kick off with some introductions, which I'm gonna try and do slowly so that our BSL team can sign and spell the very many names and titles that we have. So joining us from Campaign Against Arms Trade um, is uh, co-facilitating myself, uh, Caroline and Kirsten. And we've got Tammy on chat box and Sienna, our events organizer, organizer of this weekend. And then thank you so much to Eze and Nakisai, who are our BSL interpreters for today. And we're also joined by Jay, who's our graphic note taker and Laura on tech support. Thanks so much to the team. So on our panel today, um, we're really happy to be joined by Mel Evans, who is the head of Greenpeace UK's oil campaign, and Sam Mason, who is policy officer on climate change and a just transition at Public and Commercial Services Union, um, as well as Daniel Selwyn, who's an educator and researcher with the London Mining Network, and Eleanor Lisney, who's an activist and co-director of Sisters of Frida. So a quick heads up on our format for today. So we'll open with the four speakers who will have 10 minutes each and then we'll have a short comfort break and then we'll have a Q&A uh, discussion at the end. A uh, quick bit of Zoom housekeeping before we start. So the event is in webinar mode today and that means that you will not be, if you're an attendee, you'll not be seen or heard at any point in the event. Only the panelists have their video and microphone on. So you won't be featured in the recording, but the event will be recorded and shared afterwards. Please do ask questions for our speakers using the Q&A box. Um, if you put it in the chat box, your question might not be seen. But um, for, do use the chat box to speak to panellists and attendees. Um, and for any tech support, just use um, uh, panellists in the drop down box of the chat box and we can help you. So if you're less familiar with Zoom, you might like to select speaker view for the presentations at the start and then switch to gallery view for the Q&A afterwards. Um, as well as thinking of questions for our speakers, it would be great if you could tweet about the event as we go. So the hashtag um, for the It Starts Here Weekender is um, hashtag ISH 2021 online. And please do check out the other events and trainings over the rest of the weekend. I will ask Tammy um, to drop a link in the chat box for you to check that out. And if you're new to CAT, you also might like to find out more about our work as you do that. So without further ado, let's get started. You can't have failed to miss this week the news, um, the headlines around the launch of the government's integrated review. If you did miss it, the UK is gonna increase military spending by an additional 24 billion pounds over the next four years. So that's the largest increase in military spending in 70 years. Um, we're gonna see nuclear warheads increase by 44%. We've got £6.6 .6 billion in new money for military research and development, and that's going to help fund a new RAF Space Command. The list goes on. Um, but foreign aid is going to be cut by something like £4 billion, um, and that will have a predicted 50% cut on aid to Yemen, um, which is also a site of the world's worst humanitarian um, crisis, um, helped uh, created by UK made bombs and fighter jets. So the review that launched this week, um, it claims to make climate change uh, one of the UK's international priorities, um, but the funding tells a really different story. So you compare the £11.6 billion in the review for international climate finance, um, that's half of the amount uh, granted for military spending. And this is broadly how our government is kind of framing and funding our security. It's really about projecting military power. Human security, on the other hand, is a concept that came around after the Cold War. And it sees security not as just about protecting territories from military aggression, but about protecting and empowering people against threats in a much broader sense. So things like climate change and economic deprivation. So the panel today is going to be exploring some of the factors that undermine our security and drive conflict, and we'll touch a bit on what a more people-centred security policy would look like. Um, so let's get started. Um, no discussion about human security would make sense without the climate crisis at the heart of it. 
Um, so here to tell us more about the biggest threat to our shared security is Mel Evans. Um, a really warm welcome to you, Mel. Mel is head of Greenpeace's oil campaign. She's also an artist and a theatre practitioner and campaigner. She works with Liberate Tate, Platform London and Fuel Poverty Action. And she's author of a book that I've just bought called Art Wash, Big Oil and the Arts. She's one of the Stansted 15, who's a group of activists um, who recently won their legal case after grounding a deportation flight in protest at the UK's hostile environment policies. Mel, um, you're really welcome. When you're ready, it's over to you. Thanks so much, Caroline, and thanks everyone at CAT and to the other speakers on the panel. I'm really glad to be here with everyone today to have this really important conversation. And thank you to everyone who's come from their homes to attend the event. Really looking forward to your thoughts and questions once we've all spoken. So yeah, I'm Mel, I'm part of Greenpeace UK and I head up our oil campaign. So I'm gonna talk a bit about some work that we've been doing as part of our wider climate work and how that relates to the question, the idea of security. And then I'm gonna go on to talk about a particular campaign that we've worked on with Friends of the Earth Scotland. So it's actually great to see so many people from Scotland dialing in today. And Platform London that's been looking at the particular experience and role of high carbon workers in the transition away from oil and gas that's necessary if we're going to tackle climate change. And then I will also say a, a few brief words about how did these questions relate to the government's idea of security given the way that it treats migrants and refugees in this country at this time. So to start with the climate crisis, this in essence is the biggest threat to our shared security. The threat that the climate crisis poses is the loss of lives and livelihoods on a scale never known before across the world. People in the climate movement, as many of you will know, I'm sure, have been fighting for decades to try to stop climate wrecking companies, particularly those in the high carbon sectors and governments around the world from worsening climate change and producing this great risk to all of our security and safety. When I first got involved in climate activism, it was actually 15 years ago in Scotland um, when the G8 summit was held in Scotland and many of us were out on the streets demanding that governments around the world take climate action and try and stop climate change altogether. We were trying to stay within zero degrees of global heating. But now we're at a point where, although governments and companies around the world have acknowledged that climate change exists and climate denialists no longer get space on media platforms, we're now struggling to try and stay within 1.5 degrees of global warming. So why do these 0.5 degrees of warming count so much? Well, each 0.1, degrees leads to greater loss of life and livelihood around the world. People's homes, people's families, people's neighbors and communities, all their lives will be at threat because of the various aspects that the climate crisis brings from flooding to fires, to um, loss of um, habitats around coastlines around the world. So at this point, this decade, we're really trying to, on account of the advice of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, to stay within 1.5 degrees. And that means that this decade, we need to half global carbon emissions. And that means big changes, and it requires a transition because if you were to turn off all that infrastructure overnight, 
that would have a, a really harmful impact on people's lives <laughs> because right now uh, hospitals and schools and the way we get food is all quite reliant on infrastructure that involves fossil fuels. So I want to go on to talk about how do we start beginning that transition in a fair and just way. So because we've campaigned on the oil industry for a long time, trying to get oil companies to decrease production of oil and governments to stop licensing new production of oil. We wanted to ask, what does this mean for the workers who've put their lives into this industry that in our current society is key work? <laughs> it's, you know, it's hard work, it's dangerous work, it's out at sea on rigs where people are at risk of injury and it's part it produces the energy that enables all of our lives to to keep moving now that doesn't mean that we can't question or challenge this industry but it is important for us to recognize the important role that workers have played in keeping society going so together with platform london um, who you can look up online there an um, energy democracy campaigning organization and Friends of the Earth Scotland, who are the Scottish branch of the global Friends of the Earth movement. Together we said, okay, let's ask oil workers <laughs> what they think about the transition away from fossil fuels in order to tackle the climate emergency. And so last summer, when we knew that many workers had lost work due to the oil price crash, which followed the start of the pandemic, we said, how are you doing? <laughs> Knowing that people were at home, um, we called them up and we had conversations to say, how has this impacted you? What does the future look like to you? What do you want the future to look like? And we were able to get 1,400 offshore oil and gas workers to respond to the survey, the finding of, findings of which you'll, you'll see in a report called Offshore. And I'll pop the link in the chat shortly. And what this showed was that overwhelmingly workers in that industry are actually having a really tough time. Morale is really low. 81% said that they would consider leaving the industry. And over half of them said they'd like to gain work in renewables or um, offshore wind. They said that the most important thing for them in a job was job security. And that's exactly what they're lacking now in the oil industry. Because far from the glory days of the 80s, the work now is very casualized. So lots of workers are on zero hours contracts without any rights or protections for their working conditions. This is a huge challenge to security in the transition because as we start to phase out oil and gas production, there becomes a greater risk to those workers' health and safety at work when companies start to squash the bottom line, start to make cuts and put pressure on workers when there's less money to be made. At the same time, there needs to be huge government investment to unlock the scale of jobs that will be needed to replace those that people had in the oil and gas industry and find new work in offshore wind, renewables and green energy onshore. So I encourage people to take a look at the findings of the report itself. There's some case studies in there so that you can hear directly from workers. But I think the key thing for us here 
is that we're trying to explore, well, what does security mean for this group who are at the kind of front line of the transition and changes that we have to make so that we don't put the whole world's lives at risk because of climate change? And that's the, the question that we're trying to get into. Perhaps we'll get into the question of the hostile environment more when we, we get into the discussion after the speakers, but I will just briefly say that the very fact of the government's treatment of refugees and migrants by holding people in appalling conditions in army barracks around the country, by the Home Secretary suggesting that it could be a good idea for the UK to follow Australia's appalling practice of holding migrants and refugees offshore in absolutely horrendous conditions and the conditions on Maru have been widely criticized around the world. This shows us that this is not a government that fundamentally cares for people. And that's what the base question has to be in our campaigns is, what are we doing that's about caring for people, people's lives, people who've suffered so much already and that security really has to be about care. So I'll stop there and I look forward to the discussion going on today. Thanks. Thank you so much, Mel. Um, that was setting the scene beautifully. Um, really important question whose security the government is really concerned about. And thanks also for reminding us how critical it is that we involve workers in um, a just transition and in building uh, industries that are really kind of centered around real security. Um, so the UK is currently making 8.2 billion pounds a year um, from an industry that um, makes the world much less secure through the arms trade. Um, and we know that a green economy, a just transition cannot have militarism at its heart. We've also got to transition away from the arms trade and that would need a similarly careful work with workers. So to tell us a bit more about this is our next speaker, Sam Mason. Sam is a policy officer at the Public and Commercial Services Union, focusing on climate change and a just transition. Sam was a lead author on Just Transition and Energy Democracy, a civil service perspective, and also co-author of Aviation Democracy, which calls for the public ownership and democratic control of energy at the aviation sector. She's a member of the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament and Labour CND, and the New Lucas Plan project, which is building the case for defence diversification and socially useful jobs. To tell us much more about this, Sam, it's over to you. Thanks, Caro. And, um... Thank you to, to Kat for the invitation to speak at this meeting and also to the um, signers here, which is really fantastic. And I mean, excellent to follow Mel there. And I agree, a really good introduction and, and couldn't um, agree more that to go and look at the report that Mel's been part of producing with Foe and um, Platform. It really is excellent. Um, but obviously Mel's touched on the climate crisis. So I was just going to begin um, really reflecting that we've got multiple of crises at the moment. Um, the climate change clearly, um, the increase of automation and digitalization, the increase of militarization, the global pandemic, COVID pandemic, clearly which has impacted um, all of the world and all which is playing out now in this acute um, global inequality, which has really been highlighted um, as if people didn't realize it didn't exist before, but by the pandemic. And of course, these are global problems which require cooperation, collective action, and at the heart an agenda for peace because we can't solve these in a, a warmongering agenda. But responses to these and how we are told to understand security in today's context is of course rooted in questions of power based on the elite vested interests of competition, racism, oppression to serve the interest of a few or the proverbial 1%. And the world is in a dangerous place with events and announcements from the UK government just over the past week doing nothing to ensure that we can feel 
more secure in our communities, in our workplaces, and above all, in addressing the challenges before us at a global level. So for one example, this week, the police crime sentencing and courts bill, um, which fortunately has been delayed, but it's still there and we must continue to campaign against that. Um, as has already been mentioned, the integrated review of security, defense, development and foreign policy, um, and already articulated the announcement, including the increase of Britain's nuclear stockpile by 40%, which I think for most of us really was a surprise um, from where that has come from. And of course, the billions of increase in investment in military spending compared to investment in people and communities to address the challenges we face. It's not just immoral and a slap in the face to the NHS workers in the face of the 1% pay offer, but an absolute dereliction of duty of this government towards its people and people around the world. And from a trade union and working class perspective, where our duties of security are rooted in the protection of workers' rights, jobs, and international solidarity, it's equally indefensible when some unions welcome increased defense spending as a manufacturing jobs opportunity. And I think we have to put that out there because it, unions have welcomed the defense review this week. And of course, real job security will come in defining and demanding jobs for a transition to a zero carbon economy we desperately, desperately need and which is rooted in rebuilding our public services and socially useful production. And this was a vision um, which we can learn from, from the Lucas Aerospace workers in the 1970s, who elaborated an alternative corporate plan in the face of redundancies due to capitalization and automation of their work. And 50% of the work that they did was on contracts from, from government for um, the arms industry. But working with their unions across Lucas Aerospace plants, the workers formed a shop stewards combine and collectivized their skills and knowledge to elaborate a plan based on socially useful production. And what they looked at was the things that were lacking in society. Um, for example, kidney machines. They thought we can build um, weapons for war and killing people, but we don't have the basic means within our communities to actually maintain and help people's lives. So central to their plan was the understanding that technology is political. Um, and as I said, a conscious assessment that working in an industry that could destroy life, they could repurpose their skills to make things that made people's lives more secure by making things people need. So I've mentioned kidney machines, but wind turbines and accessible transport, for example. And it's quite shocking when we think today in our discussions around energy transition and renewables sector that these were all ideas being discussed long ago. But it was the kind of vision and ambition we urgently need to deploy today. Um, and we also within that need to recognize the abilities and skills of workers as, as part of you know, what we are calling the just transition. Because despite being told that we cannot transition our economy at the pace and scale required to address particularly the climate crisis, clearly in the pandemic, it showed us that we can quickly repurpose production lines for human needs as happened in the ventilators challenge and for the personal protective equipment. And this was all done at speed and a pace. And of course, with the vaccines in the way that the vaccines um, have come on board in such a short period of time. So we, we have the means and ability there to do it. Of course, it also showed us in this time, jobs which are important to our existence and human security, and not those involved in arms manufacture, despite the irony that in many countries, arms manufacture was retained as a priority area to keep open during the lockdowns and including um, aerospace in the UK. Um, but as a wider just transition to protect workers as we move from a fossil fuel to a green economy, we are also advocating for the establishment of a defense diversification agency that will deal with the specifics of the defense sector in economic conversion and ensure areas wholly dependent on defense work are central to discussions 
in establishing the jobs needed for a decarbonized and peaceful world. And the reason why we separate this out, it's part of the wider industrial strategy and just transition process, but because of the specifics within defense, we still think that there needs to be a separate element within that conversation um, to establish the, the skills and transition of those jobs and those areas which are really, as we term it, company towns. So I think just in closing, um, for those that are calling right now, in obviously the hopefully transformational events we've been seeing in the past few weeks around the protests and the reactions to Sarah Everard's um, death, um, the Black Lives Matters movement last year as well, and the call to defund the police. Um, and as they rightly say, our security lies in refunding our communities through public services and meaningful work. So we echo that call that we need to defund defense ban nuclear weapons and investment in the arms industry and jobs producing bonds that are killing our working class sisters and brothers in countries such as Yemen and build at the industrial level and in society more broadly for a new Lucas plan for sustainability, security and solidarity. I'll finish there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sam. That was really excellent. Thank you for drawing that link between defunding the police and the military and also helping us think about how our security needs are so much more that also about real sustainable job security as well as short term job security and, and our basic economic rights. Um, and thanks also for drawing attention to the hugely inspirational new Lucas plan. Um, for if you haven't heard of that before, I really encourage you to look the um, the plan up. It's still so relevant today and it's so so regrettable that 40 years or later that that idea of socially useful production is still such a radical idea. Um, here with us today to talk more about industries that are undermining our security um, rather than um, being socially useful um, as well as the links between mining and conflict and climate catastrophe is our next speaker Daniel Selwyn. Welcome to you Daniel. Um, Daniel is an educator and researcher with the London Mining Network. That's an alliance of 21 organisations working to expose human rights abuses and environmental crimes committed by mining companies that are based in London. Uh, they also campaign for social justice and the ecological integrity of the planet. So Daniel's research focuses on the links between resource extraction, militarism and British imperialism. And he recently published a report called Marshall Mining resisting extractivism and war together. Daniel, thank you so much for joining us today and I hand the floor over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you to Campaign Against the Arms Trade for inviting me to speak um, and putting on this really important conference um, and to Mel, to Sam and Eleanor on the panel and everyone else who is here to be part of this discussion we are undertaking together. And of course, big thank you to the incredible BSL team. And I'll be trying to do uh, my best to speak as slow as my nerves will allow me to. Um, I'm a member of the London Mining Network. Um, as I just said, and this afternoon, I'm going to share some of the arguments of the Marshall Mining Report that we published in November and some questions about what implications this may have for real human security and what that looks like. And what I'm about to share about the interdependent relationship between the industries of war and mining is not novel um, or theoretical to the communities that London Mining Network members organize in solidarity with, from South Africa to the Philippines to West Papua um, to Brazil. On the contrary, it is through the resistance of anti-colonial and anti-capitalist movements across the global south and by diaspora and indigenous communities in the global north that I came to an understanding of this critical juncture in planetary history as symptoms of a capitalist system that is structured by empire and colonialism. And this system, as we know, distributes the violent impacts of these crises and access to security within them differentially across lines of race, class, gender, disability, sexuality, immigration status, and other structures of oppression. And we've already heard Sam and Mel 
mention a lot of those. So these overlapping health, climate and ecological crises have exposed our shared vulnerability as well as amplified these divisions. Um, like the arms industry, um, the mining industry and companies have used the pandemic um, to reclassify or to classify themselves as essential to public interest and national security. And they've been continuing and expanding their operations despite mass outbreaks and deaths among workers and mining affected communities. We've also seen Anglo American, which is one of the biggest companies based in London, submit over 300 applications um, uh, during the pandemic to explore for gold and other minerals in the Amazon, including indigenous territories. And London Mining Network was part a signatory to an open letter with 330 organizations that the health of indigenous peoples, workers and social movements must come before the profits of mining corporations. And it is no accident that at this juncture, the Ministry of Defence is procuring up to 350 billion pounds worth of nuclear submarines, robotic weapons, aircraft carriers, space satellites. And like many others, I believe here um, that we can see sort of the emerging eco-fascist response to climate collapse and widespread social unrest because London, as we know, has been a, is a hub for the arms and security industries, but also for fossil fuels, metals and minerals, and has been for a long time a global capital for organized, though often legalized, violence against people and nature. And from our perspective at London Mining Network, we focus on companies like Rio Tinto, Anglo American, Glencore and BHP, which are at the base of global supply chains, including for the military. And one of the key arguments in the report is that militarism is more than a diversion of funds from the health of people and nature towards warfare. But militarism is itself an essential ingredient that is fueling the climate and ecological crises. So I think with Marshall Mining, what it's challenged me in the process is to extend this idea of It Starts Here, which is the name of this conference, and to extend that from the arms fairs that occur before the war zones of Afghanistan and Pakistan and Somalia and Yemen and Mali, to the mines that happen before the smelters, the ship and the factories where these weapons are being made. And I think it challenges us to see these as connected um, geographies of violence where insecurity is produced and sustained through various forms of warfare. So before being transformed into smartphones or into electric vehicles and wind turbines or even technologies of violence and war, the extraction of cobalt in the Congo, of platinum in South Africa, of lithium, in Bolivia, of copper in Mongolia, and gold in West Papua is already occurring in the context of militarized displacement, occupations of communities, resource extraction, and labor exploitation. And what the report does is draw attention to the vast quantities of natural resources that are required to assemble the weapons for war, for borders, for surveillance and for security. And to remind ourselves that every tonne of minerals that is extracted leaves even larger volumes of toxic waste in its wake that poisons soils, waters and air all over the world. So if we take, for example, the government announcement this week, which has been mentioned to increase the nuclear weapons stockpile, we have to put this in the context of Britain's nuclear weapons, which is intimately tied to the Rossing uranium mine in Namibia, which was operated by Rio Tinto during apartheid occupation, in a similar way to how the atrocities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki are tied to the uranium mine of Shinkolobwe in the Congo under Belgian colonialism. And today, much uranium mining still happens on Aboriginal lands in Australia by Rio Tinto, an Anglo-Australian company. And I think here we can see the links between the destruction 
of ecosystems and habitats, which we could call ecocides, as well as the destruction of communities and cultures, which we could call genocides. Um, so another connection that we wanted to highlight here is the significant overlap between countries that the UK sells arms to or provides police and military trainings for and the countries where UK mining companies and fossil fuel companies are extracting resources. And the Ministry of Defence is explicit that being one of the world's largest exporters of arms and security equipment helps to assure the UK's access to these resources. And this um, trade in arms and in training and in counterinsurgency is not disconnected from the intimidation, the surveillance, the harassment, the forced disappearances and the assassinations that communities resisting mining experience on a day-to-day -day basis. So to draw all of these together, or this reality um, where spaces of violent insecurity are produced as sacrifice zones in the pursuit of national or imperial security. I'm coming into this panel with a lot more questions than answers about what real human security means or looks like. So I'm looking forward to the discussion where we think about this. I know that many London Mining Network partner organizations um, advocate transformative alternatives under the yes to life and no to mining campaigns which emphasize indigenous sovereignty and land rights and the rights of nature i also want us to ask ourselves um, whether it is possible um, to reclaim the discourse of security and to think about who this discourse is for and whose interest it serves to ask ourselves whether it may be irretrievably rooted in colonial military and capitalist grammar, to ask ourselves whether it commands us towards order and the destructive attempts to securitize what is inherently ungovernable um, from the Earth's ecological systems to the patterns of human and non-human animal migrations, or does it command us towards justice and solidarity as we've heard from Mel and Sam and others and how expansive can we Im imagine these words and verbs to be and feel like? So I look forward to discussing that. Thank you. Thanks so much, Daniel, for your contribution. Um, I think the, the report and your words really lay out clearly how mining and militarism feed each other and um, have both have such a catastrophic impact on our human and planetary security. Um, I'm sure there'll be lots of questions for you and for the other speakers. Just a reminder to add your questions in the Q&A box for the end of the session. And last but by no means least, today we really wanted to um, spend some time thinking about what future security policy could look like if it was more people-centred with a focus on rights and well-being. Um, a human-centred policy would include action on things like economic inequality and institutional racism and equal access to decent housing and work and so on. And our next speaker is an amazing activist and advocate for inclusion and access. Eleanor Lisney is a founder member and co-director of the Disabled Women's Collective Sisters of Frida. She's an access advisor, an aspiring creative practitioner and a co-founder of Culture Access. And she's a member of the Social Investment Consultancy Advisory Board. She was born in Malaysia and has lived in Strasbourg, France and studied in Austin, Texas. She has written for Media Diversified and she's passionate about embedding intersectionality in all her work. She has two grown up children. Eleanor, you're very welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. And I'll hand it over to you. Uh, thank you very much. First of all, I uh, like to thank uh, all of you for inviting me into this panel, because I must admit, to, to, to start with, I was very puzzled as what I could contribute, um, because, well, as Sister Safrida, most of the time um, when we do speak, we straddle the sort of disability sector and the women's sector. Um, I think it might not be the first time, but I, I get very seldom to come and talk at sort of the wider picture. And I'm grateful because it made me think. And um, so 
well, I can say to join up the spots because um, to look at the sort of, yeah, the bigger picture. Because when we talk about armed conflict and arms and stuff like that, um, I start thinking of the money and the costs, not just the financial costs, but also the human costs. And as I said, that I, I come from Malaysia, so it's not surprising that I am anti-colonial. Um, and post-colonial <laughs> and um, very much the sort of, um, you know, this, this, this kind of thinking is, is let's just say when, when, when I was growing up in Malaysia, you, you don't think about these sort of things because it's very easy to be put in jail for, for, for having even, uh, you know, going to any protests or in thinking about it, even if you're doing it as social work. And, but that is the sort of background I come from. And, and so when I come to the UK, I'm having to, 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 to sort of include all of this and think that even the supposedly cash strapped developing countries will pay for arms rather than save their citizens from poverty. And when we say security, so what security? It's not the security of the citizens very much. It's the security of the people in power. And it is to keep uh, people in power, including the arms trade, because the UK earn rather a lot of money from selling arms. So the UK is no different. And again, I, I'm speaking about joining the, spo the, 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 the spots. As disabled people, we are often brushed off as, um, or as BME, that our needs cost too much and there's no money in the public coffers for funding us. So access to housing, healthcare, jobs, services isn't there. Um, very seldom we sort of challenge um, the kind of money, uh, the, the, where the public money goes. And recently I've started to challenge that in my own local council and, and, and see in a way how how difficult it is as a sort of grassroots organization to kind of fight the inequality. I mean, austerity is often branded about. And there, so that's the human and community costs because we're not able to contribute to society if we don't have the necessary support such as accessibility, equity and inclusion. And as always, disabled people face fear of cuts in the UK and the lessening of support. And when you include the multiple identities or intersectionality, what, it, what as I am, a disabled person who's also a person of color. So, you know, you, you get that. And I, I don't need to go into the sort of um, barriers we face as um for, for, for COVID-19 because um because we're we're battling on those fronts. I mean I'm listening and I'm filled with awe about you know thinking about climate change, you know, you, you guys fighting against climate change and all that and how important it is because the other human costs, you know, when we talk about conflict, it's the cost of lives and how conflict maim lives of all men, women, and children. I mean, like conflict zones, people acquire impairments. And it's also worse for women and children. The gender barriers in conflict zones mean that women's lives are destroyed by the community's perceived roles of women as homekeepers, workers, child bearers, wives, and mothers. 
The stigma of disability is very much a global issue. And, is, and at the moment, we there's two weeks, uh, not in New York anymore, but used to be in New York, the UNCSW, the Com Commission for the Status of Women, which is two weeks um, starting the beginning of last week and, and lasting two weeks, where um, the discussion about women's issues. And this, this year, it's online on, on, on Zoom and, and other things. And I remember one of the things we did as part of the UK NGO uh, of um, women's organizations. And I made the point that we should include having a strategy for emergencies to include measurement measures for disabled people so that we're not abandoned, um, you know, doing things like floods and, and fires. At, at that time, it was, um, it was that hurricane in, in, um, in uh, <laughs> my brain's gone. Um, what was it called now? Hurricane, oh, ne never mind. Um, you know, because very often disabled people are not thought about. And somebody else has mentioned about immigration. Think about how much more difficult it is if you're escaping, if you've got a mobility issue, if you're disabled. How, how, many, how many disabled people have you read about that have managed to escape arriving on boats? Boats are not accessible. Um, so, you, you know, so the sort of climate change do affect us, uh, but, you know, it really needs, well, I needed to really kind of think seriously about it before I put the, uh, join the uh, dots together. So I'm going to end with the, lastly, with the fear of, um, lessening freedom for protests and speech. As somebody said, I'm, I'm an activist and I've been involved in many direct actions. And I'm also a member of the NUJ, National Union of Journalists. And I'm wondering about the curtailing of reporting um, the, this uh, kind of protest and being able to be there without being arrested. Um, part of Sisters Uncut, for example, the Kill the Bill protests. Many of us are part of that, you know, because we are protesting about the uh, domestic abuse and violence against women. So what is, you know, my question is security, but whose security? I think other people have mentioned that. It's the sort of security against us for putting our lives at stake, the sort of things that mean uh, a lot to us, but we might not be able to um, voice about them anymore. Thank you. Thank you so much, Helena. I'm sure you've inspired a lot of thoughts and ideas there for our discussion about the and different elements that will have to be involved in a more human approach to security. So that brings us to the end of our panel section. Thank you so much to all our speakers and to SA and like I say, our um, BSL interpreters. Um, we're just gonna take a short comfort break now for five minutes and then we'll come back for a Q&A with our speakers, which Kirsten will facilitate. So please, if you haven't already, drop your questions in the Q&A box and we'll see you back here in five minutes at let's say 10 past three. Okay, thank you. We're going to take some of your questions. Uh, and I see there's, there's been quite a few of them put in. So uh, we'll try and get to them as, as quickly as we can. Um, there's quite a few questions. So we may not get through them all. So bear with us. So I'm going to start with a, a general question from Anna, who's asking, if we're arguing for a more human centered approach to security, what would you say current policy is? Would you call it state security? And whose interests do you think are being protected in this? Who would like to answer? 
Mel, go for it. I can have a go to start and obviously others can come in. I mean, the first thing for this question, which I think is a really good one, makes me think is, well, elite interests are being protected by the state security process. So elites in society from owners of multi-billion corporations to those connected to those in political power who tend to all be from a very similar social group. <laughs> Many of them went to school together and those schools were very, very expensive and elitist. So yeah, there is a, there is a ruling class <laughs> in the UK who are protecting their own interests. And that's the first thing that it comes down to in um, when we you know, question what state security is trying to do. And yet, of course, it sells it at the expense of the often working class individuals and young people who join the military and whose lives are actually on the line to protect the, the interests of, of those elites and the ruling class in our country. Um, I'm sure there's more that could be said, but that was, that was my initial take on it. Thank you. I can see some of our panellists nodding along. Daniel, would you like to add something? I can see you uh, agreeing violently. <laughs> I definitely agreed um, with, with, with Mel there. Um, I think the only thing I'd add, I think when we're talking about state security here in Britain, we're not just talking about the security of a nation and the ruling class within that nation. We're talking about the security of, of an empire and the ruling class at the head of that empire. Um, and that's what I think connects um, the mine sites across the global south in Africa, in Latin America, um, and in Asia with the military bases, the extensive network of military bases that the UK has from Kenya to Oman to Belize to Brunei. And these are all part of, um, and these are all connected um, to yeah, maintaining maintaining the security and the profitability of of the British ruling class and the and the multinational corporations that are listed on the London Stock Exchange, which includes both the arms companies and and the mining companies. So I definitely, yeah, adds just adding and building on 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 onto what Mel was saying. Thank you. No, again, it's uh, it's clearly a, a huge challenge. Another question um, coming from uh, Dabashis, who's who's saying um, a brilliant and comprehensive summary about uh, the Lucas plan. They're asking, can I ask what strands the new Lucas plan are addressing, especially for the positive use of technology, things like alternative consumption models? So it's really a question for Sam. Thanks, Kirsten, and thanks for the, the question. Um, I suppose at the moment, and, and just like every other group, I mean, we've been massively impacted by COVID and the lockdown and not meeting, but uh, I mean, our starting point is that it's, it's not technology itself that is bad per se. It's obviously the application of technology um, and it's the politics of technology. Uh, obviously there's enormous um, questions around artificial intelligence and how much more pervasive that's becoming across all of our sort of worlds and society um, and elements of control. I mean, I think we, we, we still want to have a sort of more deeper political discussion really about what socially useful production means in today's context, because clearly when the Lucas plan workers were coming up with their plan, um, it was a different world in the sense of the organization of production. Um, and, and sort of manufacturing and factories, which we don't have today. And we're seeing obviously as well in that sense of collectivizing um, from a sort of labor movement perspective, clearly again, sort of obviously with the pandemic and lots, but lots, lots of people also not working from home, it's accelerated a, a number of processes enabled a more sort of creeping of AI and related technology without any clear real national discussions about it and social license for it. But obviously some of these things could be beneficial for society and that, that's the conversation we need to have is about how we make those things of benefit to um, 
people. I mean, there are jobs, um, I hate to sort of refer in the, the nuclear industry, but unfortunately we have got a huge de decommissioning program, for example, where you could see some things like robotization would actually be a protection for workers um, by not putting them into vulnerable situations and um, sites of harm. But obviously it's a way in which they're used to, which really just links to the sort of first question about security and who security is for, um, that they're far more pernicious and have become sort of tools of repression um, and um, oppression as well. Um, throughout society and throughout the workplace that we really need a deeper discussion on these. So we're, I mean, we're, we're not looking at specific projects per se in the Lucas plan at the moment. And I think we try to, particularly in the last year or so, focus a bit more on some of the organizing aspects of the Lucas Aerospace workers, um, which doesn't get picked up so much, um, particularly when we think of how trade unions organize so I, I think, but it, I mean, it's a very good question and certainly something we're continuing to talk about. Thank you. Thank you. Elspeth uh, asked a question about technology. Uh, they say, is there a danger of putting too much faith in technology? And they're saying in dealing with climate change, but I would argue, as we just heard about, if you like, ensuring equality as well, leading us to believe that we can avoid making significant changes in the way we live. Who would like to answer that? Mel, go for it. I can kick us off and <laughs> please do come in with what I'm missing. Um, yeah, I think it's a really important question. This government in particular is keen to say that a technology called carbon capture and storage will be this magic fix <laughs> for our rising carbon emissions. And it's one which climate activists have argued against for a long time, because as a technology, it's been talked about since the early 90s, and it is still 30 years on, unproven at scale. So it remains a kind of fantasy technology. But the government and big industries are investing in carbon capture and storage projects up the northeast coast of England, along the east coast of Scotland, with the idea that this will provide the jobs that are needed as an alternative to the fossil fuel industry. And it's dangerous thinking because it lets companies go on polluting with this magic fix on the horizon that will suck up all their carbon emissions and hide them under the ground somehow. And yet it's, it's not available. But what is available is another technology. <laughs> so, and this brings us to the kind of the balance because some new technologies are going to be really, really useful and important to us in tackling climate change. So on offshore wind, is a fairly new technology that is actually, you know, becoming the cheapest form of electrical power in the world. And it's, you know, it's renewable. It is not dependent on exploiting oil resources around the world and the harmful social and environmental impacts that that brings. There's you know, new technologies to be developed around home heating. And people might have heard talk about heat pumps or ways to heat the home that don't rely on fossil fuel gas. And when we're thinking about fuel poverty, cheap forms of renewable energy are a really powerful way to pull people out of fuel poverty and stop people having to make a choice between heat or eat. So I would say it's a it's a double sided thing with technology. Some are going to be good for us, and some are magical floating unicorns that are just an excuse for big business to keep polluting. Thank you, Eleanor. You are you are flagging. Yeah, I I agree um, with Mel that it's a 
double-sided um, sword, whatever. Um, I'm not talking about it from the sort of climate change um, point of view, but technology is always sort of waved about by local governments and governments as the panacea for healthcare and um, sort of this is this is the answer to disabled people's problems because we can use technology. One of the things that we very often also flag up the dangers of um, technology in using technology because we still have a digital divide and a lot of people get missed out. And also there's, a, there's danger in, in using technology because um, you don't know that somebody could um, hijack your technology and, 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 and take over, you know, like people who are in domestic abuse, um, family situations. Um, so, and I, I, for example, um, I'm very careful about, you know, all the cards that you can have that you can save because yes, you do get sort of a few discounts, but on the other hand, you're letting the supermarket and whoever wants to, you know, get the data on what you spent and how much you spend on certain items. Um, maybe I'm just being paranoid, but I, I don't, I don't think I am because, um, you know, so the sort of technology is, 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 dub, is, is, is double-sided and I'm worried for um, disabled people because on the one hand, apps are good because it helps you to do a lot of things. On, on the other hand, that what about all those people who don't have that technology? They might live in a Wi-Fi poor area, you know, or in a rural area, or maybe they can't take advantage. And, and the government leaves them out because everything is, they say it's online and you can't get online. Thank you. And in fact, I'm really glad we broadened out the issue around technology because there's been several questions being asked about technology. So this kind of answers them. So thank you. Um, Sam. Yeah, I was just going to add a couple of points on that. Um, I think that, I mean, I think it's really important that Mel highlighted that actually, you know, obviously offshore wind is technology as well. So I think we need to be careful about how we talk about technology um, and the issues of carbon capture storage. Um, I, I think, you know, from a trade union perspective and just transition perspective, one of my concerns and certainly discussions around the movement is that we, we don't look at, um, we, we often look at the transition as well, we've got a set of jobs here. Well, if we invest in carbon capture and storage, we can recreate, you know, like sort of almost like for like jobs, but in a, you know, so-called zero carbon economy, which isn't the case. And I think all this comes down to issues of ownership and control and power. And that's at the heart of it. And we've seen this happen um, in the natural gas sector now that are pushing um, hydrogen and blue hydrogens, which is gonna rely on natural gas, rather than looking at straightforward things that we can be doing. I mean, they're not straightforward, but in the sense of, um, you know, like retrofit and construction areas and things like this, which would immediately reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but we still refuse to um, invest in those areas. And I think that's very important, again, with the things that Eleanor raised, because from our perspective, when we talk about climate change, we talk about it within a framing of climate justice. So economic, environmental, social and political justice, um, which we would add to that. So I think every solution that we would look at, it has to be tested against all of these. It has to be tested against gender, race, class, disability, um, as well and the future jobs and I think we have a na very narrow conception of how we talk about the transitions that are made and therefore again it feeds into you know how do we envisage the world as we want it to be that gives 
real security for people and accessibility and you can actually um, benefit from the changes that we need to make and it just reminded me when Eleanor was speaking um, I was actually really horrified and it kind of goes back to the sort of more direct question that was put to me earlier about technology that there was I mean, a couple of years ago there was talk about you know for disabled people making ship machines so that they could stand upright at a you know kind of production line and sort of this would somehow be inclusive employment because we'd be able to get um, disabled people to work it was absolutely horrifying I couldn't believe that that was seriously being talked about that some people thought that was a great idea um, but again it's this thing about you know ownership and control and participation and participation in the discussions which is very much at the heart of the lucas plan ideas um it's not about us sitting and designing things it's about us as communities collective in society having the discussions about what our needs are and the solutions for it and bringing our knowledge and our um you know social relationships into those so we, we better understand them and meet across society what are real social needs um, and that are defined by people and not at the higher level of the elites um, who have got the vested interest in driving forward certain technologies or policies, for example. Brilliant, thank you. Daniel, what do you think? What was your really really great points from everyone so far? So I'll just I'll keep this bit short. I agree that I think technology is neither inherently evil or inherently emancipatory it does depend on the kind of mode of production and ownership over that over that technology personally i fall more on the side that the luddites made some good points um but with the sort of dangers to tech to technology in particular this idea that there's always going to be a technological fix i think is very inherent to capitalism and what that doesn't deal with is the inherent contradictions in capitalism which depends on relentless growth and accumulation and consumption of resources on a planet and on which those resources are finite and i think even though there are a lot of positives to the technology that have been mentioned to have offshore wind or electric vehicles again unsurprisingly i think it's important for us to put that in the context of the green or the yeah, expanding green sacrifice zones across the global south where massive mines for cobalt in the Congo and for lithium in Bolivia are what are the inevitable consequence and the expanding consequence of the demands to decarbonize in the global north. So I think it's important to have these discussions about um, green transition and just transition, but it has to be on this on this kind of on this global perspective because there's no yeah, London or the UK being the off the capital for offshore wind or being fully decarbonized um, isn't going to solve um, the planetary implications of the climate crisis if it's just dependent on extracting and taking those resources from elsewhere and producing insecurity and ecological disasters in other parts of the world. So I wanted to add that to it. Brilliant. Thank you. Well, we've got three related questions coming up. So I'm so, I hope the questioners don't mind if I sort of merge some of them together. Um, an anonymous uh, person says, um, we need to have a huge campaign about what is security. They say, when we examine it, it seems clear that it's not through arms and bombs. Uh, how could we make this a central question in all discussion on security and defense? And Reinhardt is talking about, well, how do you, how do you get that kind of discussion happening in, a, in a, a situation where you've got first past the post and many citizens are, are being convinced that the military is necessary uh, to protect them and Kevin talks about how militarism just seems so normalized so how do we have this discussion more widely what do people think Sam okay I'll, I'll start off this time <laughs> to avoid Mel always being put on the spot first. Um, um, yeah, I I mean, it's, again, lots of really big, interesting questions there. I mean, I, I, I think the, the militarization agenda has become highly normalized in the past 10 years or so. 
Um, we see this in language around, you know, response to flooding. You know, we need boots on the ground, get the army out um, to, to deal with flooding, which is really interesting when you speak to, you know, fire and rescue service workers um, who say they're absolutely useless in response to flooding, they get in the way, um, you know, and what they actually need is the resources to deal with floods properly. Um, so I'm just struggling with my earphones and microphone, as you can probably tell. Um, so, I, you know, so I think we have to challenge that language. Um, I think I saw it may have been put in the, the Q&A already that even for the COVID response, everything's been put in a sort of war mentality. Everything we talk about is in a war mentality. We don't talk about in a peace mentality. Um, we, we need to keep challenging this narrative. You know, if, if people are parents and they've got children in schools, they need to raise questions about the increased role of actually the, the military coming into schools, of funding um, parts of our public infrastructure, which they, you know, and, and obviously some of the arms corporations as well. I think we, 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 we just need to keep taking that up. And then as a trade unionist, it's something, you know, I, I feel passionate about that we, we need to um, tackle more strongly um, within our own ranks about how we look, look at jobs. I mean, we, we're never saying you know, as a trade unionist, as I said earlier, we're there to protect workers and protect jobs, but not jobs at any cost. And we can protect workers through a transition and future jobs that are obviously going to be better for people and the planet and everything else. Um, but, you know, we, we have to fight and create the conditions where we can move people out of the defense sector or out of fossil fuel jobs into sort of more peaceful jobs and those socially useful jobs and have those conversations because I, you know, and this might be quite a strong point for some people, but I think we cannot stand on platforms of um, being anti-racist and that we're supporting jobs that are actually killing people in countries of the global south. Um, particularly in, in places like Yemen and saying, but that's because we need jobs. It's a nonsense. So we have to start being frank about that. Thank you. Thank you. I was looking across at Eleanor because Eleanor's uh, a, a well-known campaigner on such things. How do you think we change the conversation? I think you've caught me there. I, I... I, I don't know. I mean, because I'm very conscious of that. I, I didn't mention it. Like I, I said, I was a Malaysian and I was horrified when I found out that the UK had provided Indonesia with a huge amount of um, weapons to suppress, um, uh, I can't remember the name, <laughs> my, my brain late in the afternoon um uh, and and uh, uh, people that i've i've really admired um who are trying to fight for their independence um the timorese would that be yes thank you um so i i i think that people have to be ethical and in, in the sort of jobs that they did. And and I'm very worried, and I'm also a trade unionist, um, and I'm worried that maybe I'm in a privileged position and I can't say to somebody, well, you can't work for, you know, such and such a company because obviously, you know, you can see what they did overseas. Um, I can mention here a, a, a disabled charity that I really object um, by um, incarcerating disabled people as they did in the UK 20, 30 years ago, and they're now doing in places like China and in, in Indonesia. Um, and I'm asking colleagues, so how can you work for a charity like this if you know what they do? And in, in, this, in, this, in the same way, you know, I would ask, I had this huge campaign about not buying things from Tesco's because of what they did in Thailand. But but those are kind of like, you know, almost, almost personal. I mean, what do you do about it? 
as a campaigner, what do you do about those kind of things? Because people look at you and, and think that you are mad because they don't share they don't share that kind of ethics. And also I feel guilty because I think maybe I'm being privileged because I don't have, I, I'm, I'm self-employed. I don't have to kind of think about, you know, where, where my money comes from, or, you know, I, I make sure that I don't invest in places that deals with arms and I go to banks that I know are ethical, but maybe that's, that's a privilege, you know, and um, yeah, I, I, I don't know if that is a very long answer to say I don't know. It's talking about it that helps us make sure we know this is where this stuff is being talked about this right here. This is this is where we talk about this, because unfortunately, that as we're hearing that that discussion is just getting started, I think, in in the UK. Um, I've, had, I've, I've seen several discussions on, on the subject of, of alternatives, and there's, there's one around mining, so I'm going to look at, look at Daniel. Um, Jan says, um, concerning the impact of the mining industry on the climate crisis and the link with militarization, what will we recommend to countries of the global south who are depending on their income for the mining sector? And I think we could also talk about this, too, about countries which depend on their income from hydrocarbon exploitation or other exploitation, but they're asking about, they're asking about mining. So they're saying just stopping with all mining activity is mostly not an option. What are the alternatives? It's a really good question and a big question. Um, so like I said, there are a really broad range of, of alternatives that are put forward for this. And London Mining Network works with mining affected communities all over the world to have different strategies of resistance and transformative alternatives to the pollution of their communities and the imposition of um, industrial resource extraction on their lands. Um, I think it's important to contextualize um, the what was framed in the question as the dependence of a lot of these countries in the global south on um, these kind of extractive industries in in the in a colonial um, and imperial history where their economies were forcibly incorporated into the into the global economy um, as um, exporters of raw materials. Um, so often cases, and this is this is a big issue that's happening in in Europe at the at the moment, where the kind of rural frontier in Europe is being reopened for a lot of mining operations. But for a very long time, um, we've been happy to um, externalize or outsource the resources that we need um, to the Global South. But I will say a, a few points as, as pointers or indications of what alternatives could be. Um, for example, a community um, resisting mining that London Mining Network has worked with in Amadiba land in um, the uh, in South Africa on the Eastern Cape um, put forward their own alternatives. They were resisting a titanium mine from um, destroying the Kolobeni sands um, and the ecosystem that they've lived on for, for generations. Um, and their alternative approaches were saying, we don't want the mine, we want agriculture, we want tourism. They were putting forward their own um, ideas of what a sustainable um, ecosystem and livelihoods for them could be. And I guess it's taking, taking the lead from those communities about what they want to use or not use their land for. Um, and that will bring up all of the kind of inherent contestations that happen locally, nationally, globally, about who has access to resources and which areas of like the Earth's landmass are designated as sacrifice zones for the purpose of getting resources that are needed to maintain a certain standard or level of life that we've become accustomed to here. So I think there are a lot of really difficult questions there. And I guess my only answer is that the answer is gonna vary depending on the local and specific context in all of those countries and communities where most of these resources are being extracted from at the moment. But I think for at least many of the ones that London Mining Network works with, the answer isn't um, to just continue industrial resource extraction 
which pollutes the soils, the water and the air for future generations um, that future generations are going to depend on. So yeah, I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. I'm sorry to say we're starting to be beaten by the time. So um, I, what I would ask is if, if you've got, have you, as, as you've been listening, if you've got any final points you'd like to make our panelists on, on anything, on security, on what you, what you think the future might hold, now's the time. What, do you, what, what, what are your final thoughts? I'm looking across at Sam, thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll make a, a start. Um, I mean, one th thanks to Kat again, um, the signers and everybody on the panel. I always learn so much from other panelists when I do these sessions, um, which is absolutely brilliant. And I think it just shows the, the breadth and depth of these discussions, which are happening amongst many groups, but we need to find a way to bring this together. And I suppose the important thing right now and stuff that I'm involved in is obviously we've got the climate change talks in Glasgow this year. Um, we need to ensure how we get these kind of conversations into the, the, the framework of our organizing and mobilizing around the COP discussions, as they're called. Um, I'm really pleased that as somebody who's part of the COP coalition that we've got um, military and the impacts of military and climate change onto the agenda of that within the coalition. But I think we, we've got a space and opportunity and obviously building from the various protests and movements that are taking place now um, to widening out this discussion and link across and be intersectional across all these things because it does all relate and into that bigger question um, about our future security, not of the planet, but obviously of people and all living life on the planet from whichever the um, impact is coming, whether that's the prospect of nuclears, climate change, etc. So um, thanks again to all of you and obviously the participants. Thank you. Thank you. Mel, any final thoughts? Thanks. Yeah, I think the thought that I'm left with from all the great contributions from the audience as well as the amazing words of the panelists is a question around why talk about security when we might talk about care so in this kind of unique moment of the pandemic when there's rightly calls for a proper resourcing of adult social care and of the role of community in providing care for each other. Um, how can we take that more widely into how we think about resources and movement of peoples around the world, that all of these things are things that warrant care rather than some notion of security, which tends to protect the few. Lovely, thank you. And finally, Eleanor, we're doing a little bit of a go around. Any final thoughts? Uh, not really. I just wanted to echo what Mel says about about care and, and COVID nineteen. Actually, there's 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 a lot of you know questions and more questions than 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 answers that that I have to do with the care as well because it's not so easy and it sounds without sort of seeming patronizing or anything it sometimes it could sound very lovey-dovey but you know for <laughs> sometimes for disabled people the care can be very problematic it depends on how the people do the care and care can be so um make you feel powerless in a way because it's also still the authorities you know and people decide what care you need and it, and very often you are not given the choice and I'm talking about I've been talking a lot with people of mental health survivors as well and what happens to them so but I agree care is actually better than uh, security you know for me I thank the police as well because I know that they have helped me and all that sort of stuff but it's a it's a double thing. I mean, I <laughs> I'm happy to see the police when I need them, but not when they might arrest me. 
if that makes sense. I mean, that makes sense, doesn't it? Thank you. Well, thank you. And I, I think that is, is I'm afraid, the, 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 the limit of our time. So it, it goes to it goes to say thank you to uh, all of our panelists, to, to Daniel, to Mel, to Sam and to Eleanor. Um, Thank you to both our, our signers, uh, Eze and, and Nakishai, and uh, to uh, Tammy and to Caro, who've been uh, doing the support and we're doing the thing today. And also Sienna, who's been producing this, and Laura, who's been doing the tech. It's it's a team effort. Thank you so much. Um, just for everybody's uh, thing, we have uh, the, the, the event continues this afternoon. We've got Scotland and the arms trade and debilitarizing education at 4.15, uh, if you're signed up for those. Um, there's a, a, an event this evening around artists, and then it, it all takes place tomorrow with various courses if there's if there's space. So thank you, thank you, thank you, much appreciated, and uh, and, and all the best. Thank you very much indeed. Bye.